The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. To you, O Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbiter? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed, for though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, What shall I do? For I do not have space to store my harvest. And he said, This is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. And I shall say to myself, Now, as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This night your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for all who store up treasure for themselves, but are not rich in what matters to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Uh, praise God. What amazing readings we have today. Oh, the through line through all of the ancient readings here becomes obvious what the Lord is zeroing in on. But before we dive into these amazing readings, just a word of thank you. We just finished last week our vacation Bible school and went off with, uh, with great success. We had over 50 little ones and teens for the whole, the whole week, and it was a great week with the sisters and the volunteers and the parents. So again, thank you to all of you who helped participate and who sent your kids to it. All the kids are so excited. The father, we want it to be three weeks, three-week Bible school. And so they were so uh, fired up about the Lord and, and, and the beautiful scripture verses that we, uh, that we, we, we played with them with, and we had games and, and such. So it was a great success. So thank you. And also last Sunday... It was a great joy. Our parish welcomed back one of our spiritual sons, Brother Brian. I don't know if many of you know him, but he went and joined the religious community about three years ago. He joined Pro Ecclesia Santa. You know, they're, they're present here, the sisters especially. And so the youth group welcomed him back on Sunday evening, and it was a great joy because they haven't seen him in three years. And so he came back, amazingly, with a, a Roman collar on already. And so they, they were amazed to see him dressed up as a priest. And he said, when are you going to get ordained? God willing, he'll be ordained in seven years. So total, 11 years of formation. So it was great joy that our parish sent off one of her sons and he returned <laughs> to say hello just for a brief visit. And also, I won't say his name yet, but after Mass last night, a young man, one of our parishioners, his father, he's in his early 20s. I can't get the priesthood out of my mind. I, no matter what I do, he's, he's, you know, he's off on his career, living a good life. He says, he just won't get out of my, my head. And so pray for this young man. I'm going to meet with him hopefully soon. Because God is always calling, by the way. What is God asking of you? 
especially you young people. God is calling. Whether it's to the priesthood, religious life, God is always calling. So pray for him. Lastly, it's not even my homily yet, and I'm still rambling on. <laughs> One of the great fruits of COVID, when we all shut down, uh, my previous parish, we set up a website for my homily so that way I can help communicate with the people. And so, and we still have it going. And so, so the people have been asking for access to, to homilies, if they can share it. And so if, if you want any homilies, there's, all, there's a website, which is my name. If you Google my name, there's a website, fatherbriansullivan.com. You can get all the homilies here. And also on any podcast. If you listen to podcasts, you just put in my name, and there's Father Sullivan's Sunday sermons. And so you can, you can subscribe there as well. And I highly recommend it, especially if you have trouble sleeping. My, my homilies are amazing if you have trouble sleeping at night. And the greatest thing is free. It's free. You need no prescription. With, with my homilies. I guarantee, if you have trouble sleeping at night, listen to my homily, eight hours sleep, guaranteed. <laughs> Promise you that. So if you want access to the homilies, just, just Google my name on any podcast or search it and it'll pop up. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Have you ever wondered, one that, ever wondered why? Why do we love money so much? Why is it so intoxicating, money? Why do we love it so? Oh, right now, I don't know what the latest number is, the, the, the latest lottery. It's at, I don't even know, do we have it yet? I'm not sure. I don't keep up. I just see headlines. But it was at one point over a billion dollars. And everyone's going crazy buying, I bet you many of you have bought tickets. If you win, by the way, don't forget us here at St. Mary's. Huh? <laughs> I'm tempted to buy a couple of tickets for the parish. If you do, we can pave the parking lot finally. And with that amount of money, we can pave it in gold. Right? That would be amazing. A gold parking lot. Oh, it would be amazing. Oh, but we love money, don't we? That's exactly what our Lord is speaking about in our readings today. Guard against all greed. And so it leads to the question, if you ponder it, why do I love money so much? And I thought about this question. Because in a way, money is amazing. We need it. And I thought of three aspects which money tends to give all of us. The first one, money removes our fear, doesn't it? You think about it. Nobody in here today is wondering whether or not you're going to eat dinner tonight. Nobody. Nobody. We all know probably your, your, your food is defrosting in the sink right now for dinner. We all know we're going to have food this evening. Or if we're lazy, we can go to the restaurant and someone else cook for us. It gives us, we have no fear. We're all going to sleep comfortably in a soft bed with Father Sullivan's homilies lulling us to sleep, right? <laughs> Money gives us security. And rightly so, we work hard. Money removes our fear. Money also, if you think about it, gives us choices. We can live practically where we want to, of course, within our means. If we go to the grocery store, if I feel like chicken tonight, I buy chicken. If I want to have a fat, juicy, New York steak for breakfast. Don't judge me. I've done it. I go to the store and I buy steak. Oh, I can wear whatever clothes I want. Oh, we go to the outlets. We can go crazy. Look at all of those vast choices. It gives me freedom to choose. I can drive what I want to drive, wear what kind of shoes I want to wear. Again, all within our means. And good. Money gives us choices. Thirdly, if you think about it, and if we're honest, oh, money gives us a sense of self-worth. If I have more of it, I can sometimes think, oh, I'm somebody. 
aren't I? Ah, oh, look, look what I've acquired. There's an easy tendency sometimes to think that the more I have, the more I am. Because as we all know, money can afford us a certain respect. Oh, I guarantee you, if you have some homeless person walk in here, we'll all look at them and kind of gaze at them and turn away immediately. Oh, but if a rich man walks in, oh, all of a sudden, everybody, all of us will change. And we'll treat this person who's rich with a certain amount of respect. Oh, money affords us that. And sometimes we can think that, oh, if I, if I just acquire more, then I'll be better. Because if we're honest with ourselves, oh, aren't we constantly comparing ourselves to one another? Oh, we all, we all tend to do this. Oh, look at so-and-so, they have that. Oh, what do I have? Oh, so-and-so has the newest version of this. Oh, what do I have? Much of our economy is based upon this tendency to give us the flashiest, newest, most beautiful thing to attract our eye and to go after that. Why do you think new iPhone models are coming out every year? Is it because we need it? No. It appeals to this tendency which we all have. Oh, if I just had the newest, ah, then I'm better. Why do we use that as a measuring stick to compare ourselves to one another? Oh, we all do this, if we're honest. We must hearken back now why this tendency for us to love money. In order to penetrate these deep mysteries, we must first go back to the beginning. Oh, read the book of Genesis. If it's been a while since you've read the book of Genesis, much of our, much of our current predicament could be found in Genesis. I want to read you Genesis chapter 4. And to set the context of this, so in Genesis 3, we have the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent. The fall, original sin. So that's chapter 3. Then immediately after the fall, when original sin enters in, then chapter 4 comes in. And the story of Cain and Abel. And this story highlights what happens. So Cain and Abel are the, are the children of Adam and Eve. And so immediately, let me read this to you. And then he begins to see... I quote, Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Remember that point, by the way. Cain and Abel are offering their harvest and their, and their livestock back to God. In, in other words, a portion of their income back to God. Keep that point in mind as I continue. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. So, what you have here, you have Cain and Abel, two brothers, the first children of Adam and Eve. They now have to give a percentage of their income back to God. Cain offers his offering, Abel his other one. Who does God look with more favor? Who's offering? Who's offering is it? Abel's. But Cain, he looks down upon. Again, the question is, for, as we're reading scripture, why? It is because as the story continues, Abel offered more. Cain held back. Why did Cain hold back? You see, immediately after the fall, what begins to happen is, notice this dynamic now. So we are, you and I are creating God's image and likeness. We're created for communion with God. That's what life is. Life is all about God in relation with him, the share in the life of the Trinity. But Adam and Eve reject God, and therefore all of us now do. And so what that leaves, it leaves a gaping hole in my life. It leaves this hole, this gap where God used to be, but through our free will, we reject him. And so the number one tendency now, and all of humanity, we all do this, because I have this gaping hole, the number one tendency now is to fill it with stuff 
money, possessions, houses, a nicer car, phones, more tech, more this, more that. I keep stuffing my, my, this, this gaping hole. It's like an endless pit. I keep filling it and filling it and filling it. Cain fell into this. Because why did Cain hold back? Because again, he's fallen into the trap. If I just keep more for myself, then I'll be better. See, this is why God looked down upon Cain's offering, because he knew that he was keeping it for himself out of greed. His brother Abel let it go. You see, when, if we base our lives upon this endless pursuit of more possessions and more things and more money, we would immediately live a life of jealousy and anger. Because there will always be somebody with more. There will always be somebody with a bigger bank account, a nicer house, and a newer car. There will always be somebody who's better than us. And if we're constantly using that as, as to compare ourselves, we will live a life of jealousy. And look what happens next. What did Cain do to his brother? He killed him. St. Paul, in the second reading today, did you notice what he said? It was towards the end of the reading. Paul, now speaking about saying, think of things that are above rather than what is on earth. And it says in his, in his powerful line, he says, the greed that is idolatry, guard against it. He's speaking about this tendency of the human heart to latch onto stuff as our main love. Paul is saying, all right, we all have this idol in our hearts of, 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 of the almighty dollar. Tear it down. Stop worshiping it. It will not give you the, the joy and the hope that it promises. Where do you think is the most dangerous place to be a Catholic priest? What country? I'll throw it out there. What do you think, what country is the most dangerous place to be a Catholic priest? It's kind of, you don't have to yell it out, but it's just kind of in your, in, your, in your mind. The most dangerous place in the world to be a Catholic priest today. It's not in, it's not in, uh, in the Middle East. Sometimes we think, oh, maybe Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's not, not in China either. The most dangerous place to be a Catholic priest today is a country where 85% of the people are Catholic, by the way. It's Mexico. Mexico is the most dangerous place to be a Catholic priest. Within the last few years, 15 priests have been murdered. Why do you think that is? It is the regions in the north where the drug traffickers reign. And whenever a priest speaks against them, they kidnap them and do the most horrific things you can imagine. Those drug traffickers, what is upon their altar which they worship? We know. They'll do anything to keep that idol. Ah, but Jesus says, not for you, Christians. Guard against this greed. This is why, by the way, from the very beginning, Christianity has always been as part of our worship and a part of our culture. We always gave back to God a percentage. Today, we don't have the 10% requirement as it did in the Old Testament. The church doesn't give us a number, but she gives us a principle. She says, give from sacrifice. That whatever you give back to God, make sure it stings just a little bit. Because if it stings, that means that's that greedy heart. That's the old heart of Adam and Eve dying just a little bit more. 
whatever you give to the church, make sure to the church, to charity, or to, what, to, to whatever good cause. Make sure it hurts a little bit. Because that's that greed dying. Take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.